Welcome to the Hospital Finance Podcast, your go-to source for information and insights that can help you stay ahead of the challenges impacting healthcare finance. And now, the host of the Hospital Finance Podcast, Michael Passanate. Hi, this is Mike Passanate, and welcome back to the Hospital Finance Podcast. Today, I'm joined by John Dalton. John is a Senior Advisor Emeritus here at Bessler Consulting. And John has joined us to discuss uh, a topic that he has delved in on uh, entitled American Healthcare, Worst Value in the Developed World. Um, This is part of a a three-part series that was uh, written in the Garden State Focus and uh, the subject of a lecture at the Philadelphia and New Jersey HFMA Annual Institute in October 2016. And that lecture provoked quite a bit of debate and discussion about how and whether American healthcare can close the gap with the rest of the developed world and attain the triple aim of better care for our patients, improved health in our communities, and lower per capita costs of care. John recently completed 13 years on the board of trustees of the St. Joseph's Healthcare System, where he chaired the Strategic Planning Committee. He serves as honorary trustee at Children's Specialized Hospital, where he is a former board chair, and most recently was named by the New Jersey Hospital Association as its 2017 Hospital Trustee of the Year. Welcome to the show, John. Nice to be back with you again, Mike. So as I mentioned, this is the first part of a three-part series, and we're going to start out by looking at the relevant data. So John, what first prompted your interest in this subject? Back in September 2008, I was part of an HFMA delegation to Russia. There were 23 of us from the U.S. and five from the U.K. Uh, So we spent four days meeting with our Russian colleagues, uh, comparing notes, uh, touring hospitals and clinics, uh, discussing delivery models and funding mechanisms. Among other things, I walked in with a U.S. chip on my shoulder talking about U.S. health quality indicators at uh, uh, the National Research Institute of Public Health in Moscow, uh, with you know, a lot of pride in what I've seen us accomplish in U.S. healthcare over the last 40 some odd years. Uh, to my surprise, when uh, push came to shove, when we finished our four days, uh, the Russians told us how much they admired our use of advanced technology uh, by our skilled clinicians in very well equipped hospitals, but uh, they expressed a preference for the national health system's cost efficient delivery of high quality care. So that really you know, for me and the others in the delegation, it was kind of a, a little bit of a shock. And uh, that American paradox became a, an area of continued interest for me. And what rekindled that interest to come back and revisit this topic? Uh, in February 2016, there was an article in Modern Healthcare. Actually, Modern Healthcare has a by the numbers column at the back of each issue that I always flip through and look at. And in that issue, uh, they showed um, data for. Uh, 22 of the developed countries in the world, including the U.S., all members of the OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, what percentage of gross domestic product they were uh, devoting to health care. And for the first time, uh, the table also showed by type of universal health care and the three different approaches. Uh, so that re-triggered my interest. Um, here in the U.S., we certainly have the best equipped hospitals, and we've also got the most thoroughly trained physicians. Uh, but somehow or other, uh, those two don't mesh to produce uh, high-quality, uh, low-cost health care and value for American consumers. So I decided to take a deeper dive. So let's talk about some of the data that you did look at. Um, I think one of the first things you do is, is, is that you grouped the OECD countries. So can you tell us that when, you know, what the outcome looked like when you grouped those countries by type of approach to universal health care and what you found when you did that? Sure. Uh, basically, when you look at universal health care, there are three different approaches. Uh, there are some subtle differences among them, but uh, one approach is called the two-tier approach, and that's where the government provides or mandates catastrophic or minimum coverage for all, but then allows supplemental voluntary insurance or fee-for-service care when the, the patient desires. Uh, that includes five countries, including France, Israel, and the Netherlands, who take that approach. The second approach is called the insurance mandate, and that's where the government mandates that all citizens must purchase insurance, whether private, public, or not-for-profit insurers. Uh, There, there were five countries in the table, including Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. The third approach is one that we hear a lot about uh, in the U.S., that's single-payer, 
Under single payer, the government provides insurance for all and pays all expenses except for co-pays or co-insurance. And there are 11 countries listed in the table, including Canada, Italy, Japan, and the UK. Uh, we had the data from the OECD. I went further and also pulled data from the World Health Organization. That's the uh, authoritative source for key health indicators. So among other things, I pulled the uh, data on uh, life expectancy at birth, infant mortality rates, uh, child mortality rates, and adult mortality rates to see how all these countries stacked up. And what I did is I first looked at, arrayed them all on the table. I stretched out the worksheet. I made a worksheet that kind of stretched out what modern healthcare had shown. And on the left, I put the healthcare percentage of GDP. And on the right, I put life ex expectancy at birth. Uh, the percentage of GDP, I had data from 2000 to 2013. For life expectancy, I had data from 1990 and 2012. So different time periods, but uh, similar results. And in looking at that, unfortunately, the United States was at the bottom of, of the alphabet and also at the bottom of the barrel in terms of the results. So the next step I took was to aggregate the data by type of uh, approach and use that, those three types of approach and care, compare that to the U.S. And those findings were kind of interesting. John, that's a disappointing result uh, for the U.S. What did you decide to do next? Well, as I mentioned, I aggregated the data by type of approach to universal health care and then looked at the, uh, the key indicators. So the first thing I looked at was uh, life expectancy at birth uh, and percentage of GDP. When I looked at that, the um, United States um, from 2000 to 2013, in 2000 we were consuming 12.5% of gross domestic product on health care, and that had gone to 16.4% by 2013. And our life expectancy at birth had increased from 75 years in 1990 to 79 years in 2012, so an increase of four years. The other countries, uh, if you looked at all 21 of the countries, life expectancy had increased from 76.6 years to 81.6 years, a five-year increase. So we were behind at the start and further behind at the end. Similarly, on the percentage of gross domestic product, uh, the 21 countries averaged 7.9% in 2000 versus our 12.5%, and they only increased to 9.6% in 2013. Uh, and looking at the three different approaches, uh, the single-payer countries had the uh, best result. Uh, their healthcare percentage of gross domestic product averaged 9.2%, lowest of all the groups, and their life expectancy at birth had increased to 81.8 years, uh, same as the countries with the two-tier system uh, and uh, ahead of both the U.S. and the countries with the insurance mandate approach. So uh, after that, uh, the next one I looked at was child mortality rates. We place a lot of emphasis on that. We see a lot of the press about uh, child mortality and infant mortality. On infant mortality rates at the, in the U.S., we were at 7.8 per thousand in 1990, and we moved to 3.3 per thousand in 2012, which is a significant reduction. Oh, I'm sorry, kill that. I was reading the wrong line. <laughs> okay, next I looked at infant and child mortality rates because uh, those draw a lot of interest here in the U.S. We see a lot of press about them. And... The U.S. was at uh, infant mortality rates averaged 9.0 per thousand in 1990, and we dropped them by a third to 6.0 per thousand in 2012. Uh, seems like good progress, but when we looked at the other 21 OECD countries, they started out ahead of us at 7.8 per thousand and dropped to 3.3 per thousand, uh, almost a 60 percent reduction in, in infant and child mortality rates. Uh, on the child mortality rate side, we started out at 11 per thousand in 1990 and dropped to 7 per thousand in 2012, which is a 37 percent drop. Uh, however, the 21 OECD nations dropped from 9.5 per thousand to 4.1 per thousand. Again, almost a 60 percent drop. So they were ahead of us at the outset and further ahead at the end of the day. Then looking at the three approaches, uh, in insurance mandate, single payer, and two-tier, once again, the single payer countries had the lowest infant and child mortality rates uh, in 2012 and uh, had shown the largest percentage reduction. Looking at adult mortality rates, uh, 
for males in 1990, the U.S. was at 173 per thousand and dropped to 130 per thousand by 2012, about a 25% drop. The 21 OECD nations in the aggregate were at 141.4 per thousand in 1990 and had dropped to 89.9 per thousand in 2012, uh, about a 36% reduction. Uh, for females, our female adult mortality rate was 91 per thousand in 1990, dropped to 77 per thousand in 2012. Uh, for the OECD countries in the aggregate, uh, they started at 72.1 and finished at 49 per thousand in 2012. Uh, so we had a 15% drop in female mortality rate. They had a 32% drop in female mortality rate. Uh, once again, uh, when looking at the three types of approach, uh, the single-payer countries in the aggregate had uh, the lowest adult mortality rate, male in 2012, at 86.8, and female, 45.6 per thousand in 2012. Uh, so once again, the single-payer countries produced the best outcome. John, there's so much more to talk about. I'm looking forward to... Uh, you got ahead. Oh, I got ahead? Okay. okay. That's well, fine. On a question. So, John, lots of statistics and information there. What did you conclude from all of this? Uh, several preliminary conclusions that uh, needed a little further examination. Um, but clearly, despite our massive expenditures... Uh, the U.S. healthcare system does not deliver reasonable value for the money, uh, and the gap between us and the other OECD countries on key health indicators has been widening. Uh, that's quite disturbing. The surprising uh, outcome to me was that the 11 countries with single-payer systems uh, consume the lowest percentage of GDP on health care, and yet they achieve the best results on each of the four key health indicators. That came as a shock to me. The U.S. also lags OECD countries in studies by the World Health Organization and the Commonwealth Fund. We'll talk a little bit more about those uh, later. Well, it's a little comfort, but when we compare the U.S. with emerging market countries like Brazil, Russia, India, China, Mexico, et cetera, uh, we do re attain better results than them on the four key health indicators, but that's not U.S. exceptionalism. So the conclusion is that American health care is the worst value in the developed world. And it's going to take a huge paradigm shift to close the gap with the other countries on those key health indicators. Well, we'll be looking forward to discussing that in part two of the series when we take a journey through France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. John, okay. thanks. Uh, oh, did we screw it up again? Yeah. John, what did some of the other studies show? Well, I also looked at uh, some other reports. Uh, when I returned from Russia, one that I had looked at was – published by the World Health Organization in 2000, and it was their first and only attempt to look at uh, health systems throughout the en entire world. Uh, they ranked the health systems of the 191 member organizations uh, based on five factors uh, that included financial contribution, disability, adjusted life expectancy, speed of service, protection of, pro protection of privacy, and quality of amenities. In that study, France ranked number one in the world, followed by Italy. Uh, the U.S. only ranked number 37. We were behind Costa Rica and just ahead of Slovenia, Cuba, and New Zealand. However, the methodology that the World Health Organization used in that study provoked so much criticism, I guess from countries that weren't highly ranked, that they have not updated the study or used that methodology since. But it is the only one that I, uh, I'm aware of that looks at the entire world in terms of the healthcare systems. Another really good source for information on health policy and health throughout the world is the Commonwealth Fund, based here in the U.S. Uh, I'm on their emailing list, and for anyone interested in health policy, it's a, it's, a good, uh, it's a good one to be on. They periodically compare the U.S. healthcare system with those of other developed countries, a more limited set, typically 10 other countries. In their 2014 update, uh, entitled Mirror, Mirror, On the Wall, How the U.S. Healthcare System Compares Internationally, the U.S. is last or near last among the 11 nations studied in the report on the three dimensions of access, efficiency, and equity. The United Kingdom ranks first, followed closely by Switzerland. Uh, that's one worth looking at because the, they have a nice little table that looks like something out of Consumer Reports where dark blue is good, light blue is bad, and medium blue is in between. And they list 
the countries are Austria, Canada, France, Germany, and Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK, and the US. Uh, and going from left to right, uh, uh, at the right-hand side of both the UK and the US, the UK typically in dark blue and the US in lighter medium blue. Uh, so it's disturbing. Uh, with per capita healthcare spending of only $3,405 per person, the UK ranked number one on nine out of the 12 factors that the Commonwealth Fund measured. The US ranked f number four out of, uh, ranked last on four out of the 12 factors, despite our spending of $8,508 per capita. So that's a lot, uh, $5,100 more than the UK. So clearly, we are not getting value for the, for the money. The Commonwealth Fund's conclusion uh, was that the U.S. delivers, quote, high-cost care of mediocre quality, uh, noting that uh, our per capita expenditures are $3,100 higher than the average of the other 10 developed countries in the study. So we have a pretty steep mountain to climb to catch these folks. And, John, we've, we've gone ahead and collected some of the slides that you used in your presentation. We'll have those available on our website for anyone that wants to, to dig into this information a little bit more. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to uh, and looking forward to part two of this uh, series where we'll take a journey through France, Germany, and the United Kingdom to explore their systems in more depth. John, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. Hi, this is Mike Passanante, and welcome back to the Hospital Finance Podcast. Today, I'm joined again by John Dalton. John is a Senior Advisor Emeritus here at Bessler Consulting, who's joined us to discuss uh, his topic, American Healthcare Worst Value in the Developed World. John recently completed 13 years on the Board of Trustees of the St. Joseph's Healthcare System, where he chaired the Strategic Planning Committee. He serves as Honorary Trustee at Children's Specialized Hospital, where he is a former board chair, and most recently, was named by the New Jersey Hospital Association as its 2017 Hospital Trustee of the Year. Welcome back, John. Thank you, Mike. It's nice to be here again. John, in part one of the series, we ended with the Commonwealth Fund's conclusion that the U.S. delivers, quote, high-cost care of mediocre quality, with per capita expenditures of $3,100 higher than the average of the other 10 developed countries in the study. John, which countries did you decide to examine more closely after looking at that data? Well, to start with, uh, I wanted to get one country w with each of the three approaches, two-tier insurance mandate and single payer. And the choices became pretty obvious. Uh, France does two-tier Germany insurance mandate and the United Kingdom single payer. So those are countries that most would agree are somewhat similar to the U.S. in terms of robust economies, uh, high immigrant populations, uh, a fair amount of diversity. Uh, so those are the three I chose. I also dusted off a book I had read after I came back from Russia in 2008 uh, that provides a very good on-the-ground approach and look at uh, those three countries as well as some others. Uh, it was written by a journalist named T.R. Reed. And the title was The Healing of America, A Global Quest for Better, Cheaper, and Fairer Healthcare. For anyone interested in healthcare outside the U.S., it's very readable and uh, quite enjoyable. So I would recommend it. So I started by looking at key data from the three countries, uh, both the percentage of GDP change and the uh, spending per capita and the, uh, the, the outcomes. So France, with its two-tier system, uh, in 2013, spent 10.9% of gross domestic product on health care, uh, $4,111 per capita. Germany, was at, with the insurance mandate approach, was at 11% of GDP, basically a dead heat with France, uh, but spending $4,495 per capita, more than France. The United Kingdom, with a single-payer approach, was only 8.5% of gross domestic product compared to the 11% of the other two, and only $3,405 per capita uh, spending. The U.S., on the other hand, is at the top of the heap with 16.4% of our gross domestic product. It's about $1 out of every six going to health care and $8,508 per capita. So for a family of four, that's uh, $34,000. On the, the outcomes, the life expectancy, infant mortality, child mortality, uh, France was at 82 years, Germany 81, U UK 81, and the United States, 79 in 2012. For the infant mortality rates, uh, we were higher than 
uh, all three countries. So I began by looking at each of the three countries. Okay, next year question. So let's let's take each one in turn then, John. The French, uh, the French. Uh, John, let's take each one in turn. The French use a two-tier approach to providing health care. How does their system work? Well, France's system is based on private doctors treating patients who buy health insurance to cover most of the cost. Uh, it's purchased through work. The employer and the worker split the cost, and the monthly premium is withheld from the worker's paycheck. Uh, everyone must belong to an insurance fund, so the government pays the premium for those who are unemployed. In France... Patients are expected to pay at time of service, so they pay up front. They then get reimbursed by their insurance fund for roughly 75 to 80 percent of the fee. However, they, as a, they can also buy supplemental insurance to cover the part of the rest of the cost. In France, doctors make house calls, and they receive higher payment for doing so. Uh, as I mentioned, they, they can buy supplemental health insurance to cover co-pays and non-covered services. Most Frenchmen do so. All 14 sickness insurance funds are not-for-profit entities. The administrative costs are well below 5%, thanks in part to their carte vitale. Uh, the secret sauce for the French is that they've had full interoperability since 1998. So every French, all Frenchmen carry a carte vitale. It's a credit card with a chip carrying your entire medical history. If you lose one, you, you've got to pay, pay for its replacement. But basically, when you go into a French hospital or doctor's office, there is no medical records department. It's all on the carte vitale. So uh, another nice part of the French system is when a doctor submits a bill, if it's a credential doctor, the fund must pay the bill. No denials. Uh, the French system has full freedom of choice. So if Gaston decides to eat, drink, and be merry, and doesn't feel well the next morning, he can go to any doctor that he chooses. He can see any specialist at any time. The National Health Ministry negotiates with doctors, hospitals, and drug companies, and then dictates what providers can charge for treatment and what price will be paid for prescriptions. Uh, something like 77% of health expenditures are covered by these government-funded plans. The remainder are either patient payments or payments from the private supplemental insurance plans. That's the two-tier approach. Are there any downsides to the two-tier approach? Uh, one of the major ones is that French physicians do earn far less than their U.S. peers, but they do enter their practice unburdened by student loan debt. The government pays for their medical education. Uh, there have been several attempts at healthcare reform to limit the freedom of choice, but those have faced voter resistance and efforts to control payments to providers have resulted in some doctor strikes to preserve their incomes. Uh, there was one major one in Lyon in 2014. And although freedom of choice can be expensive, uh, the upside is that the French outlive Americans by three years while spending less than half per capita than we do on health care. So let's move on to Germany then. Germany has something uh, called the insurance mandate approach. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, Germany came as somewhat of a shock to me because it's the oldest universal health system in the world, and it was implemented by Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck, as you recall, was the Iron Chancellor who, through wars and whatnot, united Germany into Central Europe's industrial military power back in the 1800s. So here's this militaristic dictator, uh, autocrat, uh, founding the first universal health care program. And why did he do it? Uh, it was one way of preserving a unified Germany. Uh, he uh, was the inventor of much of the modern welfare state, and it was his leverage to make sure that the, he had working class support for unifying the German Republic. Uh, his sickness insurance law was enacted by the Reichstag in 1883. So it's already survived for 133 years, two world wars, the partitioning of East and West Germany, and the like. It's amazing. Uh, in Germany, the me medical insurance is mandatory. Uh, everyone must have medical insurance. Uh, the premiums are income-based. They average 15% of income, and they're paid jointly by employers and by workers through payroll withholding. A German can choose from more than 100 private insurance plans. These are called Krankenkassen. Uh, they compete vigorously for business. 
As not-for-profit enterprises, these funds exist to pay medical bills, not to pay dividends to stockholders. They must accept all applicants, no pre-existing conditions, and they must pay any claim that is submitted by a recognized doctor or hospital. So no denials. Uh, The coverage does include guest workers, legal or illegal, and there is a government buy-in for low-income and unemployed Germans. As in France, patients are free to choose any doctor or hospital. Uh, Most German hospitals are either municipal or charity operations, but there are some for-profit chains. Uh, The bulk of medical professionals are general practitioners working in their own private clinics. The sickness funds negotiate with the doctor's union to determine what procedures and treatments are covered in the national benefit package. So there's an essential health benefits package for all Germans. Patients never see a bill. So U.S. Post Office. (laughs) (laughs) But they are subject to a small copay. Germany, to its embarrassment, was 10 years behind France in achieving interoperability, but they implemented their digital health card in 2008. So again, no medical records rooms. As a result, their administrative costs are much lower than in the U.S., a little less than 5% of uh, the spend, even with more than 100 insurance plans competing vigorously for their subscribers. John, did you identify any downsides with the German approach? Uh, As in France, uh, complete freedom of choice in a system with minimal waiting times and high quality costs a lot of money. So the Germans are very concerned about their 45, 44.51 per capita spend higher than France and the UK, uh, but a lot lower than us. Physicians do earn less than the U.S. counterparts, but they receive a free medical education and they are not burdened with student loan debt. Uh, the government has been under a lot of pressure to moderate its cost increases. So the current situation in Germany is that the government and the sickness funds are putting a squeeze on providers. So let's move on to Britain, and uh, they have a sort of famous single-payer approach. Can you talk to us about how they got there? (laughs) Britain was an interesting study. Uh, They were late to the game uh, in terms of implementing universal health care, unlike France and Germany. And they took a distinctly different approach. Uh, The National Health Service was created by two polar opposites, Lord William Beveridge, a social reformer aristocrat who was raised in India on a tea plantation in Darjeeling, and Anurin Nye Bevan, a Welsh coal miner who was appointed in 1945 as Minister of Health by Labour Minister Clement Attlee. As many will recall, at the close of World War II, uh, within, shortly thereafter, the British dumped Winston Churchill, who was their Prime Minister throughout the world, and installed a Labour government. Under that government, uh, Attlee appointed Bevan as his health minister. Uh, Beveridge had written a report back in 1942 called Social Insurance and Allied Services. It promised free health care to all with payment coming from general taxation, not from medical fees or insurance companies. So a totally different approach from France or Germany. Uh, it was a morale booster because uh, it was issued right around the time of London being bombed during the Blitz. His plan faced strong opposition from the British Medical Association and the health insurance programs, no different from what we see here in the U.S., but in that, in, uh, with the labor government, Bevan v- was very clever. He crafted a compromise that allowed general practitioners to remain as private operators and to allow insurers to market policies to customers who chose not to join the National Health Service. So that's how they got uh, universal health care. So they're, they're in, in the United Kingdom, income and Social Security taxes are much higher than the U.S. in every income back bracket, but they result in a system, a health care system, that delivers uh, with minimal paperwork and no billing. Its nationwide network of general practitioners are independent. They're paid on a capitation basis. So that produces a very strong incentive for them to practice preventive medicine. For those of you who are fans of Doc Martin, uh, the BBC's program, you pretty much know how a general practitioner practices in the UK, or specifically in his case, Port Wen, Wales. Uh, GPs make house calls. They manage many conditions in their, their offices are called surgeries. They manage many conditions there that would be high, handled by specialists in the U.S. So that's one key to their cost-effective delivery. About 60% of British physicians are general practitioners, compared to only about 35% 
in the U.S. in internal medicine and, and the like, primary care. The British general practitioners do enjoy income levels comparable to U.S. primary care physicians, so they're on a par. Specialists are called consultants, and they cannot see a patient without a referral from a general practitioner. So unlike France and Germany, the Brits do have limited freedom of choice. Your GP tells you where to go. Uh, British have a group called the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, the abbreviation NICE, and that's the uh, organization that determines the range of medications, tests, and procedures that are, recover that are covered, uh, similar to what Sarah Palin used to call death panels. Okay. So, <clears throat> John, one of the things we, we hear about on, on this side of the Atlantic is long waits for non-urgent care within the National Health Service. Um, what's the reality of that? The reality surprised me. And again, uh, even traveling with the Brits in 2008 and uh, following them thereafter, uh, we hear all kinds of anecdotes about uh, problems with the National Health Service and the, the dreaded queues. The evidence is somewhat different. The queue is that basically there are waiting lists for non-urgent or elective procedures, things like hernia repair, varicose veins, uh, elective surgeries. Um, we have queues in the U.S., but we don't call them queues. Uh, there are also long waiting times here for those. In the OECD's report, Health at a Glance, in 2015, it noted that the waiting times in the U.K. now are lower than in other OECD countries reporting such data. So it's less of an issue than a lot of the anecdotal evidence that we hear. Uh, one of the big downsides is that the consultants earn considerably less than their U.S. peers. As you're aware, in the U.S., there's a great disparity between incomes with the specialists and our primary care practitioners. That's different in the U.K. Uh, the National Health Service has been subject to uh, tight budget constraints, so their concerns are that they have not been able to address high-risk factors like smoking, alcohol consumption, and obesity that are above the OECD average, but still better than uh, what we have here in the U.S., so despite negative perceptions of, quote, the national health, the Brits developed the best value for the money in the developed world. And that's a tough nut for a full-blooded Irishman to swallow. <laughs> so based on the data, um, other countries may have to bow and say the Brits do it best based on um, some of the objective measures. What other findings account for the ability of France, Germany, and the U.K. to produce value? Um, well, each of them take differing approaches, but there are some common themes. Uh, in all three countries, most of the physicians are private general practitioners and have no student loan debt to carry. Uh, all three countries have full interoperability and no denials. Uh, those help keep administrative costs low. In the U.S., for example, Medicare, uh, 97 cents of every premium dollar goes to services. Uh, in those three countries, at least 95 cents out of every premium dollar goes to services. Their real secret sauce, though, is a robust social services safety net in all three countries to deal with housing, nutrition, and environmental issues. Uh, that's sort of what makes them go. That led me to another uh, good summer read earlier this summer. It's called The American Healthcare Paradox, Why Spending More is Getting Us Less. It's written by Elizabeth Bradley and Lauren Taylor. Uh, interesting book, uh, a little bit dry and technical, but a lot of well-researched statistics. Now let's go back to the World Health Organization's definition of health. W the WHO defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So, emphasis on social. In their book, they make a compelling case that when social services spending is taken into account, the U.S. is not a high spender. And what's in social services spending? That's public and private spending on old age pension and support for older adults, survivor's benefits, disability and sickness cash benefits, family supports, employment programs, and other social services that exclude health expenditures. And what did they find? They had a very interesting exhibit showing several of the countries that we've been talking about and adding social services percentage of GDP to the health care percentage of GDP. And uh, it's kind of shocking when you look at the U.S. in total, we're 25 percent of GDP on combined health and social services. France, on the other hand, devotes a full one-third of its gross domestic product to the combined uh, health and social services spending. 12 percent health, 
21% social services. Germany uh, devotes 29% of GDP to, the, to both, uh, 18% to social services, 11% to health. The UK is next after us uh, with only 23% of gross domestic product. Again, 15% on social services, 8% on health. So here we are at 16% on health, 9% on social service, looking quite different, but a moderate spender compared to France and Germany. Their research further found that countries that have high health care spending relative to social services spending, like the U.S., had significantly lower life expectancy and higher rates of infant mortality than did countries that favored social spending, like France, Germany, and the U.K. So I could have avoided all of my research and just read their book. <laughs> they reached the same conclusion. Uh, and the reality is that with health and social services spending already consuming 25% of our gross domestic product, and the gridlock that we've experienced in Washington for almost forever, uh, it's very unlikely that the federal government's going to step, step up social services spending. So where is leadership on this issue going to come from? Uh, in my opinion, it's got to come from the leaders of not-for-profit hospitals and health systems in order to achieve the triple aim. Uh, it's not going to come from government. It's got to come from us. Uh, that's going to be our burden. And for those of us in the healthcare community, it's not without risk, because if we do this right, inpatient admissions and e ED visits are going to decline because we've sacrificed them for the greater good of our communities. So it's a, a lot of risk with little reward, but th that's how I see us getting there. John, that's quite a challenge. I'm looking forward to exploring what elements we might be able to apply to the U.S. to begin narrowing the gap with the other OECD countries and equally important, attaining the triple aim. So we will discuss that in part three of this series. We're looking forward to having you back for that, John. Thanks so much. You're welcome, Mike. See you soon. Hi, this is Mike Passanante, and welcome back to the Hospital Finance Podcast. Today I'm joined by John Dalton. John is a senior advisor emeritus here at Bessler Consulting, who is back to discuss part three of his series, American Healthcare worst value in the developed world. John recently completed 13 years on the board of trustees of the St. Joseph's Healthcare System, where he chaired the strategic planning committee. He serves as honorary trustee at Children's Specialized Hospital, where he is a former board chair and most recently was named by the New Jersey Hospital Association as its 2017 Hospital Trustee of the Year. Welcome back, John. Thank you, Mike. Nice to be here. John, in part two of the series, we looked at uh, data from France, Germany, and the United Kingdom, which provided us with some clues about how their approaches produce better quality health care at lower cost than the U.S. Um, let's start out. Which of their approaches produces the best results, and are there lessons we can glean from all three? Yes. As you know from the earlier part of the series, uh, France uses the two-tier system as an approach to universal health care. Germany, the insurance mandate, sort of what we have in the Affordable Care Act, and the UK is a single-payer system. When we looked at all of the data uh, about their approaches, uh, we found that the single-payer countries pr produce the best results, and uh, you know, whether you love them or hate them, the senator of Vermont was right. Single-payer pr produces the best results, and among the single-payer countries, the Brits do it best. Uh, single payer is not likely to happen here in the U.S. Uh, because it's highly reliant on taxation for funding. But interestingly, we already have two single payer systems here in the U.S. That's both the Veterans Administration and the Indian Health Service. Those are single payer systems. Are there outcomes available that will produce better out? Are there options available that will produce better outcomes and help start to help us close the gap with the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development countries? I think so. Uh, there's some elements that we can apply from France, Germany, and the United Kingdom to help us achieve the triple aim. Okay, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from our uh, colleagues in the United Kingdom, France, and Germany. Uh, but first, let's also look at uh, some of the, the issues we've already tackled and how they compare to what France, Germany, and the UK do. Uh, 
you heard earlier about uh, the frustration in France and Germany with unlimited freedom of choice. Well, unfortunately, ever since the HMO movement started in the 1980s, we Americans have had to learn how to live with limited freedom of choice and narrow networks. So that's one issue that they have that we've already tackled. The common elements, uh, we already have many of Americans who receive health care coverage through their employer, uh, just as in France and in Germany. The, American, the Affordable Care Act did include an insurance mandate, uh, as in the Germans do, but it was a watered-down one. Uh, so th- one of the key issues facing us now is that only 28% of the 18 to 34-year-old demographic actually are in the risk pool. So that's one of the reasons why there's been instability with the insurance exchanges. Um, we already have an essential health benefits package mandated through the Affordable Care Act. That includes doctor services, inpatient and outpatient hospital care, prescription drug coverage, pregnancy and childbirth, mental health and rehabilitation services. So we already have that in common with France, Germany, and the UK. What could we learn or adapt from those three countries? Well, I put together a list of seven starters that I think are worth debating and hopefully will be part of the ongoing debate as something replaces the Affordable Care Act. One, as a country, we need to move even more aggressively to get to full interoperability to reduce the administrative costs. Uh, The French got there in 1998, the Germans in 2008. We could emulate the French approach of a mandated core benefits package and allow the opportunity to purchase supplemental insurance for expanded coverage. That's an approach that I think would work well in America. Or look at Germany's employer-based insurance mandate and couple that with competition among not-for-profit insurers for base coverage. We could either copy France's patient payment at time of service approach, and as someone who spent his career in the revenue cycle, that's appealing to me, or Germany's patient co-payment approach, one or the other. From all three countries, we need to maintain primary care providers as private practitioners. I think that's part of the reason for their success. Uh, unfortunately, in the U.S., we have a, a, only 35% of our pro- pr- primary care providers, uh, 65% are specialists. It's the reverse in those countries. We need to provide incentives for medical students to select primary care. For example, forgiveness of student loan debt over 15 to 20 years to correct that current imbalance. Uh, we've already on our way to doing that. There are several programs. Texas Tech University has one at their medical school that... Uh, make sure that medical students who select primary care uh, will have their student loan debt repaid. But finally, the the seventh one is the toughest one. We need to encourage our not-for-profit healthcare leaders to engage more closely with social services providers in the communities that they serve. John, your seven starters are thought-provoking and I think well worth debating. How do you think they'll be received inside the Beltway? Well, that's when things start to get tangled up in competing interests and conflicting priorities and the K Street lobbyists uh, hitting congressmen and senators. Um, We've seen a lot of that uh, through the course of this year. As you know, in in July, the Department of Justice filed suit to block the proposed Anthem Cigna and Aetna Humana mergers, contending that, quote, they would leave the multi-trillion health insurance industry in the hands of three mammoth insurance companies. Well, Aetna, as you know, responded with the corporate equivalent of a hissy fit, eliminating its Affordable Care Act coverage in 11 states, claiming that they had $430 million in losses since January 2014. So we've got that force. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I take heart from folks like uh, Bernie Tyson, CEO of $61 billion Kaiser Permanente, a not-for-profit uh, provider. He's sticking with the exchanges long term. Here's his quote. I view it through the lens of my mission. It obligates us to figure it out, not to get out. He further noted that the market is unstable given adverse selection and underpricing by some plans to capture market share. And, end quote, over time, it's going to work itself out. This is not rocket science, unquote. So Tyson seems to have a pretty clear view of how this can be made to work. Then we have Big Pharma. Uh, There's been a lot of press over the last year about uh, drug pricing. Uh, The EpiPen has been around since 1977, but Mylan Pharmaceuticals acquired the auto injector in 2007 when they were selling for $57 each. EpiPens now cost more than $600 for a two-pack, and people who suffer from anaphylaxis, as does one of my granddaughters, 
need to keep them handy at all times. During pharmaceutical, uh, Martin Shkreli, the most hated man in America, brought Daraprim in 2015. They raised the price from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill. Now, Daraprim is the only cure for toxoplasmosis. That's a disease that strikes people whose immune systems are suppressed or compromised. Uh, examples would be AIDS patients and cancer patients. Then there's Valiant Pharmaceuticals, uh, Canadian-based, although very active in the United States. They boosted the price of the diabetes, glub, <laughs> diabetes drug, Glumetza, by about 800% in 2015. They also acquired Cara Cream in 2011 that's used for cancer uh, skin conditions. That rose by 1,700% in six years. Uh, to our government's credit, all three CEOs have been uh, held before Congress uh, for, the, uh, the, for congressional flogging, but still the, the drug prices are escalating at, a, at a, an unbelievable rate here in the U.S., and something's got to be done about it. So, John, looking at <clears throat> the seven starters and, and some of the elements you've just discussed, where do you think Democrats and Republicans inside the Beltway can come together? Well, as we know, we had a very divisive presidential election uh, with clear, clearly polar opposites in terms of health policy. We had Secretary Clinton uh, espousing expand and embrace the Affordable Care Act, uh, and President Trump advocating let's repeal and replace it with something terrific. But looking at the two platforms uh, post-election, I looked at them to see where there might be some common ground, what are non-starters. Well, clearly, when you look at Secretary Clinton's platform, uh, she was advocating universal quality, affordable health care for everyone in America, which would include uh, undocumented aliens. Clearly, that's a non-starter. Uh, she wanted to allow families to buy health insurance on the health exchanges regardless of their immigration status. Clearly, a non-starter. Uh, her platform also talked about defending access to reproductive health care and doubling funding for community health centers, probably non-starters. On the Republican platform, uh, number one priority was to completely repeal Obamacare and replace it. Uh, some of the other issues raised there were to allow sale of health insurance across state lines. That's been in Republican platforms for a number of years but has a very lukewarm response from the big five insurance carriers, so that's not likely to happen. Uh, also talked about uh, allowing individuals to deduct health insurance premium payments from their tax returns and using health savings accounts and to accumulate uh, unused portion as part of the individual's estate and requiring price transparency from all providers. Uh, ideas worth debating. Looking at both platforms, there are some areas of common concern. President Trump's, pl the Republican platform, talked about removing barriers to entry into free markets for drug providers that offer safe, reliable, and cheaper products. And believe me, I'd much rather buy my Crest store from Canada than have to pay for 350 bucks for a 90-day supply here in the U.S. On the Democratic platform, uh, there were three items that dealt with drug costs. One was to bring down the out-of-pocket costs, reduce the cost of prescription drugs, and protect consumers from unjustified prescription drug price increases. So I think one area uh, for the battle inside the Beltway will be to identify Big Pharma as a common enemy and uh, attack that. It's a very, that would be a very popular, um, that would, should be very popular with uh, President Trump's voting base. Secretary Clinton, the Democratic platform, also talked about expanding access to rural Americans who often have difficulty finding quality, affordable health care. And as we know, critical access hospitals uh, struggle con consistently. Well, that should be very appealing to the president's uh, voting base. Uh, that's something that uh, I think both Democrats and Republicans can agree on tackling. In terms of uh, the health, health savings account issue and the... Uh, health insurance premium payments, deductibility, uh, there is an intent to, for comprehensive reform of the tax code. So those probably will roll into the, the debate. Uh, I find, personally, I find those interesting and intriguing and worth debating, but my question on those is how they will play out for the folks who are employed at Walmart and McDonald's. Um, we've seen the experience with folks opting into 401ks and now we have a whole generation heading for retirement with inadequate retirement savings, I fear that the same kind of problem would uh, 
affect them uh, on those two proposals. But we'll have to see how it goes. Uh, even if on January 21st the Affordable Care Act is repealed with a, a two-year replacement period, uh, I think when we get down into the weeds, there are so many pieces of it that uh, are necessary in any uh, health reform legislation uh, that will bog down in, in some process in both the House and the Senate. Yeah, we'll know a lot more uh, come February or March. Uh, we just learned today that uh, Dr. Tom Price, rep Republican representative from Georgia, has been, will be nominated as the next HHS secretary. Uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, you know, some of his proposals including, include allowing folks to opt out of Medicare and Medicaid for tax credits, but uh, where will he be in terms of things like comprehensive joint, the comprehensive joint replacement program and the like? When we look at the Affordable Care Act, uh, we've already heard that the provision that allows kids to stay on their parents' policy until age 26 uh, will, st will stay and that uh, we, will no we will continue to have guaranteed issuance, no pre-existing conditions. There are other provisions that I think as the debate goes forward uh, will wind up being uh, carried forward as part of whatever reform takes place. I don't think anybody wants to go back to the days when uh, insurance carriers could spend more than 85, more than 15 cents out of every dollar on administrative expenses. Uh, now that we know that France, Germany, and the UK spend less than five cents out of every dollar on administrative expenses, uh, the uh, 31 states that have benefited from Medicaid expansion already are making noises that uh, they want to retain that it's worked well in their states. Many of them have Republican governors, as we do here in New Jersey, and uh, we, we know that. Uh, Governor Christie uh, is in favor of continuing the Medicaid expansion. So those are areas that will be debated. Uh, the, the, we're certainly not going to revoke the patient protection provisions that have already improved quality uh, with, with significant reductions in both central line associated bloodstream infections and surgical site infections over the last several years. So I think a lot of what is contained down in the weeds is going to be retained. Uh, hopefully what come issues out of this was something that uh, includes all uh, all American citizens at a reasonable cost. So there's going to be continued <laughs> battles inside the Beltway for some time to come on the nuances of health care policy. But, John, what can those of us involved in not-for-profit health care do to advance the seven starters that you uh, mentioned, uh, engaging more closely with social services providers in the communities that they serve? Well, the good news is a lot of that work already has begun. Um, there was an article in the May 2016 issue of Health Affairs that talked about variation in health outcomes, and it did a deeper dive into the role of spending on social services, public health, and health care, and looked, actually looked at the, the first decade of the 21st century, 2000 to 2009. And even in that period, it found that states that have a higher ratio of social to health spending had significantly better subsequent health outcomes for adult obesity, asthma, mentally unhealthy days, days with activity limitations, and mortality rates for lung cancer, AMIs, and type 2 diabetes. The article also pointed out that many of the states with those higher ratios were in the West, while those with less healthy spending patterns were in the South. So the Western part of the U.S. is already ahead of the curve on that. In reviewing 74 research studies, the article reported that three types of services are particularly meaningful. Supportive housing, nutritional support, that includes Meals on Wheels and uh, WIC supplemental nutritional services, and certain case management and outreach programs. And they concluded, and I quote, broadening the debate beyond what should be spent on health care to include what should be invested in health, not only in health care, but also in social services and public health, is warranted, end quote. Here in our area, we've already started. Um, organizations like the Mount Sinai Health System, New York Presbyterian, uh, have already have major initiatives going forward on population health and community involvement. Uh, a couple of quotes from Dr. Kenneth Davis, who's CEO of Mount Sinai, illustrate both the success and the problem. Here's Dr. Davis, quote, if a patient attributed to us has diabetes and we keep that person out of the hospital, we are rewarded in a population health model. But if we invest in preventing community residents from ever getting diabetes in the first place, we're paid nothing extra. 
even under the most advanced population health models, there is no way to get paid for improving the long-term health status of the community. Nonetheless, Mount Sinai is going forward with some of these initiatives and is at risk for doing so. Uh, Dr. Steve Corwin, CEO of New York Presbyterian, they have a, a, a major initiative going forward in Washington Heights on population health for about 250,000 folks in that population, as well as throughout their health care system. Here's Dr. Corwin, quote, if you visit the home of an asthmatic child and you remove mold and allergens from that home, it dramatically reduces that child's likelihood of coming into the emergency room, end quote. So uh, I tend to be a cockeyed optimist, even though I've been advocating for universal health care for almost 40 years now and still far from achieving it. I think that uh, the not-for-profit leadership of our major health systems are going to continue to move us forward uh, at, at an appropriate pace to achieve that triple aim. It means we have to go beyond our comfort zones. Uh, we already in healthcare excel at diagnosing, treating, and curing the patients who receive care in our hospitals. But improving the health of the population in our service areas does require us to reach out into the community services, uh, social services safety net in order to foster better health habits among consumers, something over which providers have little or no control currently. I take heart from examples like the Geisinger Health System in Danville, Pennsylvania, uh, who've been into population health very deeply for a number of years. Part of their success re uh, is attributable to the fact that they own a health plan they have a very large uh, multi-specialty multi physician practice and the healthcare system. So they've got the three pieces working together. But even there, they will tell you that it took several years to be able to change consumer behavior. And uh, the key to that, in many instances, was placing nurses in doctor's offices, nurses funded not by the health system, but by the health plan. There are many, many other examples out there like Geisinger that we need to emulate. I believe that hospitals that succeed in providing better care while fostering healthy behaviors in the communities they serve will lower the per capita costs of care and produce better outcomes on the key health indicators and begin to help us close the gap with the rest of the developed world. Thanks, Mike. Well, John, the triple aim is certainly an objective worth striving for and uh, helping to reduce the gap between the U.S. and the rest of the world uh, when it comes to um, quality of, of health care. So thanks for enlightening us and providing this most thought-provoking series. You're quite welcome, Mike. This concludes today's episode of the Hospital Finance Podcast. For show notes and additional resources to help you protect and enhance revenue at your hospital, visit Bessler.com forward slash podcasts. The Hospital Finance Podcast is a production of Bessler. Smart about revenue, tenacious about results.